Come on, let's give Jesus an ovation of worship. He's good. Yes. Hey, y'all, uh, this is my wife, Jennifer. Hi, Come on, somebody. We're, uh, we're glad each and every one of you guys are here. Um, if it's your first time, my name is Jeremy. This is my wife, Jennifer. And we are excited to not just have a memorial campus and all three additional seating rooms here at this campus, but also our Cypress campus, our Katy yes. campus, and the thousands of people watching online. Let's welcome all of them in. We're glad you guys are with us. I'm, I'm fired up. You know why I'm fired up? Why are you fired up? I'm going to tell you why I'm fired up. Because today, mm -hmm. 18 years. 18 years, that's right. Today. 18 years ago today. That's right. We said I do. And here we, we are did. celebrating by sharing our story. In I fact, know, I have some incredible. pictures of our very first date yeah. right here. Pictures of our very first date. And it was an amazing moment. Look no. at my tie. And look at your cra crazy eyes. Like crazy eyes. Like crazy eyes. <laughs> Like crazy red eyes. That was like that one though. The one on the left like looks like we tried to fix it, and then the one on the yeah. uh, left like, mm -mm. Ah, like just half crazy. <laughs> that was prophetic. It was just half no. crazy, you know. You need to. <laughs> and then another picture when we started dating, we started talking. Um, we were we, we we had just uh, gotten off four wheelers. I'm so crazy about you. I know. You. I was giving somebody the side eye. I don't know what's going on right there. I was like, hey, get off me. <laughs> um, and then and then 18 years ago today. We got married right there. Oh, look at we how, were babies. Look at how young we were. Gosh, we were babies. And here we are, and I'm still crazy about and you. I'm still crazy about you, too. I'd go hungry, I'd go black and blue. I'd go crawling down no, the don't avenue. Don't make it weird. Don't make it weird. Girl, there ain't nothing <laughs> that I wouldn't do to make you feel my, my, my. Okay, stop while you're ahead. Stop. Give your seat. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need attention right now? <laughs> 18 years you've been putting up with this. So we're going we're gonna to share with you some things. Here's what I think. All campuses, even if you're watching online, I think it's important that you take notes because what you're going to get is 18 years of hard-learned yeah. lessons. I wish we would have known this stuff before we got married. I wish we would have known this stuff early in our marriage. We've learned it. We've, we've put it into practice. And, man, it works. Here we are 18 years in. God is so good. So the first thing is I'm just going to teach you how to spell marriage. A lot of you think you know how to spell marriage. Here's how you spell marriage. It doesn't start with an M. Uh, you turn the M upside down. It's W-O-R-K. That's, that's how you spell marriage. Marriage is spelled work because yeah, hard you, work. you have to work on your marriage. Here's the challenge. I think a lot of people look at marriage like a game of Jenga. Anybody ever played Jenga before? You play Jenga, so I'm going to go first. This is this weekend is Jennifer's very first time to play Jenga. Yeah. And, ooh, that one came out super easy. Okay, All right, I'm your turn. Do no, you can't go up high. Go low, girl. Well, I go can't get erode the foundation. Look, no, that's the, those are the easiest ones to go for. Hey, I'm you know, smarter. You know, <laughs> That is not wrong. And this, and this right here is exactly what most people do with their marriage. They, they, they erode the foundation. Yeah. They take away from what it's built on. Take each and, other apart. And somehow it becomes a game. And then when one of us pulls that last foundational piece out and it, and it falls apart, it becomes a blame game. And, and this is a problem. Marriage shouldn't look like Jenga. It should look more like Lincoln Logs. Anybody remember Lincoln Logs? How many of y'all remember Lincoln Logs? Raise your hand if you play with Lincoln Logs. See, none of the millennials are raising their hands. You know why? Because they had iPods and they had games. And, all, and that's why all they know how to do is play games. Come on. Y'all not ready for these bombs I'm going to be dropping? <laughs> Look, it's even got a little cowboy, babe. There you are, babe. Hey, girl, how you doing? You know, um, <laughs> look at him when you pull him off the horse. He still stands like that. Oh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> This is a game of Lincoln Logs, and this has to be built together on a foundation. And really what we want you to do is we want you to just see, we want you to see this, see this example because you're going to find your relationship in one of these ways. You're either playing Jenga, pulling the foundation apart, or you're, you're building with Lincoln Logs. And here's, here's what we want to teach you. There's several things that you need to work on. The first thing that you need to work on is you've got to work on your vision. 
Somewhere in the back, backstage, there's a box that this came in. And the reason we were able to build the house is because we followed the instructions on the box. You have to have strong vision. That's good stuff. You do. You know, you have to have a plan for your marriage. And um, even the scripture talks about this. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. So you need to have a plan. And this is something that we've often talked about. Mm -hmm. We like to dream about our future. Right. And we have a plan and um, dreams for like when 50, 60 years from now, correct? Right. We're going to be in those rocking chairs, mm -hmm. facing west. Come on, girl. Be holding your old hand, I'm gonna, I'm gonna your old you wrinkly better. hand. I'm, I'm not going to have a tooth in my head. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, and I'm still going to love you, and I'm still going to think you're fine, baby. You're going to have some wooden teeth or something no, up in not, your head. No, not wooden teeth. <laughs> you're going to have to spend some money on me and get me some veneers because I'm going to have my teeth. <laughs> Here, here's the problem. We didn't know. We didn't know that you were supposed to have a vision. So when we first got married, we didn't have a vision, That's but right. we had love, right? And love is all yeah. you need, right? Wrong. Everybody who's ever been divorced will tell you they started with love. That's right. But love is not all you need. You know, I've, I've told you this throughout the course of the series. The only thing you need to fall in love is a pulse. But if you want to stay in love, you've got to have a plan. But, but falling in love is fun. I remember the first time that I met you, the first time that I saw you, the first mm -hmm. time that I saw you was October 99, and yeah. I fell hard in that moment. Yeah. You did not, but mm -hmm. I fell but hard in not, that moment. Yes, but I always, so, I always like to tell this because it's not the first time I saw you. I saw you at a conference, and I noticed you. Yes, you did. But it wasn't like that. That yes, came it was. later because he no, walked in, and I just remember seeing this guy with this really ugly, bright lime green shirt and <laughs> orange tie. I mean, I still don't know what you were thinking. That kind of hurts. Yeah, I still don't know what you were thinking, but you walked in. I was thinking in. I was in style. I was wearing No, you were Mr. Tommy Large Hilfiger. and in charge, and I just remember thinking, who does this guy You were think thinking, who is? is that guy? No, nope, that came later. Oh, my God. How do that I get his number? That came much later. That's what you were thinking. That's what you were no, thinking. No, no, no. <laughs> and then, we, then we, we met in 99. I felt pretty hard for you. We kind of started yeah. talking, and, and nobody really knew that we were talking. No. And I heard you tell this story a couple of years ago and it was funny because yeah. you were just telling one part of it you were telling how yes, i invited you over yes, to my house for a party. Over at, to this party at his house you, and hey you tell the story i will <laughs> and we're sitting on this couch and the couch is packed with people but we're sitting beside each other mm -hmm. and he had the lamest game no, i did not have the lame 18 <laughs> years and five kids i'd say it's pretty okay, good game i'm just gonna to say you. right there it, lame it worked, game. but it was you lame. you still sitting here. It, that's true. I'm going to give that one to you. That is true. But, y'all, <laughs> this boy starts talking about his shoulder Some injury. Shoulder injury. No. He's like, can I just, can I just I was put a cowboy. my arm I had a around injury. you? I put my arm Babe, up. it was so bad. But you were like, yes, you can. No, you I did not. No, don't believe but what, that lie. what you didn't tell people was on the way to the party that night, she was riding with a friend, and her friend was like, hey, do you know this guy, Jeremy? And Jennifer was like, I do. And this girl was like, he's kind of cute. And first I'm like, kind of. <laughs> Whole lot of. But, um, but then she was, and she didn't know y'all, she didn't know that we were talking. No. And she was like, well, I think I might try to talk to him. And Jen like changed. She went from like June Cleaver to Medea in like 0.3 seconds. She was like, nah, me and him are talking. That's my man. Because yes, she, even mm -hmm. early on, you were prophetic. You knew what you I wanted. You had I already wanted, seen baby. what you had to have. You declared a thing that was That's not right. as though it were. Come on. That is right, baby. <laughs> and, and the problem was, it was fun. It was. Falling in love. Yes. But we didn't know how to stay in love no. because we had no vision for our relationship. Right. When you have a vision for your relationship, it will force you to face your foundation. And that's the second thing you have to work on is you have to work on your foundation. Oftentimes I'll ask people, what is your relationship built on? And they'll say something like, well, it's built on love. It's built on commitment. It's built on Jesus. It's built on Jesus. It's built on Jesus. And, and really it's not. Your relationship is built on past experiences and future expectations. Right. And oftentimes those expectations aren't even communicated. This is why it makes you so mad when somebody does something. You're like, why did you do that? Well, because of their past experiences. And we're not prepared for that. We don't prepare for a life together. We prepare for a wedding. We'll, we'll take months to prepare for a wedding when we've been preparing for a divorce for years. Because we don't understand, we've been following this, this cycle of the world. Listen, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. You cannot promise your way past preparation. That's good. Some people are saying, I do, that actually can't. 
making crazy promises. I love you. I love you forever, for richer, for poorer. You didn't know that you would actually get poorer. Yeah, much poorer. <laughs> And you, and you have to be prepared for that. But oftentimes, the marriage, the marriage commitment is only as good as your ability to commit. I can promise you all kind of things. But if my track record doesn't prove my promises, then are my promises any good? Some of us are marrying people we wouldn't loan $100 to. <laughs> when I walk into the bank and I ask them for a loan, if I roll up in there and I'm like, what's up? I'm in my best suit. Like, what's up? Y'all give me a loan. Look at your boy. I look good. Will you pay it back? I promise. Okay. No. They say, let us see your license. And then what do they start doing? They start checking my credit. But no, 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 no. I promise. I'm going to pay it back. I promise. Oh, your, your promise is no good. It's your track record. That's good. The most important thing on your wedding day, most brides would say, well, it's a dress. It's the dress and to make sure that my bridesmaids don't outshine me. You know, it's the dress. And to make sure that my mother-in-law, my future mother-in-law doesn't wear a big white dress. You know, we make it weird. And the groom would say, well, the most important part of the wedding day is the honeymoon. You know what I mean? <laughs> like brides prepare their whole lives for the wedding and grooms prepare that their whole lives so for the honeymoon. You know, that's but true. But the, the most important thing on your wedding day is your, is your past. Yeah. Because that's what proves whether or not you can do what you're saying you're going to do. Your past is the greatest indicator of your future. Well, you don't understand. We're crazy about each other. He's been so kind to me. We've been in love for 10 weeks, but he's been an idiot for 10 years. <laughs> Give it some time. I promise you, who they really are will come out. And it's important that you know before you say I do, who they really are. Because I believe that commitment should stay binding. Amen. And you should stay married. You should stay strong in that. And there's some things that you can do that we believe will help you. I want you to talk about single people. Where are the single people at? All campuses, where are you at, single people? Hold your hands up. Keep them up. Look around. That's what you're working with. <laughs> we got three campuses, a whole now. bunch of services. Some of y'all like, I'm going to another campus. I don't we got, we got connect groups starting up, I form a group. It. I love it. <laughs> but no, talk about single yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. Single people, we've talked about this throughout this series, and you guys know that you need to set your standards high. Don't just settle for anybody with a pulse. Don't be like, he's just breathing, so I guess he'll do. <laughs> That's not going to work. That's not good. You need to look for somebody who is going to honor you and respect you, value you, and love you. And look at, at the way they treat their family. Look at the way that they treat treat their friends because ultimately that's the way they're going to treat you. Absolutely. And you learned something. You had a revelation yeah. throughout the course of our marriage that, that when you said it the other day while we were preparing, I was like, hold up, wait a minute. Yeah. But I want you to that say it and explain right. people that are married what they Absolutely. need to do. Absolutely. So I think that married people, some of you need to lower your expectations. <laughs> Now listen, I feel like some of us have set so many high expectations on our spouse and then when they don't meet our needs, you know, we, that's where we think we get our joy from. And mm. it's not. They can't make us happy. Only Jesus can make us happy. And this is something that I did early on in our marriage. I expected you to meet all of my needs. And when you couldn't, my whole world came crashing right. down. I didn't realize how broken I was. Only Jesus could meet my needs. That's right. Well, and, and the, at the end of the day, what happens is we put so much responsibility on our spouse yes. to bring me joy and to bring me peace. How many times have you heard this said, or maybe you've said it, well, you don't understand, he just doesn't make me happy anymore. Yeah. She just doesn't make me happy anymore. That's a personal problem. That's not your spouse's problem. The Bible doesn't say the joy of your spouse will be your strength. No. It says the joy of the Lord right. will be your strength. You find that foundation in Christ, and then you live in the overflow. Absolutely. Here, here's what Romans 15, 13 says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you That's trust good. in him so that you may overflow with hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, you can't do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't recover from what we recovered from without the power of the Holy Spirit. We walked into our marriage with 
with wrong expectations, tough past experiences. I came from a family of healthy marriages. You came from a family of broken marriages. Yes. And all we had is love. We didn't have wisdom. We didn't have knowledge. We didn't have understanding. But boy, we had love. And we hit a brick wall on day, on, on day one. But yeah. I want you to talk about some of your past experiences and what, what you I went will. through. I will. So um, I was a victim of sexual abuse. Um, in fact, my earliest memory, I was age four. The abuser was my brother. He was someone that I adored. Thankfully, I told my other siblings who told my parents about the abuse. I can remember um, talking to my parents, and I actually remember my brother coming home, and I'm watching as my do dad walks out to meet him in the driveway, and I remember my brother hanging his head down, and that's the moment that I knew that they knew that he knew that they knew. And then, I, you know, 30 years ago, the way that they handle things, they're not like the way they handle things now. And so my parents were actually given the option to either put him in jail or send him to the military. So they chose the Army. So he went away. Nobody explained that to me. And the, due to the stress and the pressure, my, my parents got divorced. And no one explained that to me. My father just went away. And so my mother loved me. My parents loved me. You just didn't deal with that stuff. So we just didn't talk about it anymore. Five, six years later, my dad and my brother show back up. My brother came home, a, a war hero. I went to the party like nothing ever happened. He continued to stay in my life like nothing ever happened. Fast forward to 12 years old. My mother uh, meets her high school sweetheart again, and they marry. And I'm very excited because now here, you know, I have um, another person in the house who is a father figure, and he was very loving. He has two sons. I was very excited. One was close to my age. One was older. But I was very excited because I felt like now I have a, a sibling, but they were both very mean to me. The older one started name-calling and body-shaming, killed my self-esteem. Mm. And then behind closed doors, he was trying to rape me in my own home, always trying to sexually assault me in some way. People were there. Still, I was very vocal about it. I was telling my parents, but because he was older, he convinced them that I was lying. So now I start connecting the pieces together, and I'm like, oh, well, this happened to me when I was four, and it was okay, and this is happening to me now, and it's okay. No one will do anything about it. So I guess this is the way that men are supposed to treat women. I needed attention so badly because I just felt so ugly that I realized very quickly at the age of 13 and 14 that if I started acting a certain way and dressing a certain way, I could get positive attention and I can control that attention. And so when I entered high school, I went to my very first football game and I caught the eye of a senior in high school. He was 18. How old were you? I was 14. My mother allowed me to go on my very first day and please listen to me, parents, don't do that. Don't do that. We're not ready for that at right. 14, 15, right. even 16 years old. We're not ready. I was not ready to experience the type of relationship I was walking into. That's true. I quickly fell for this guy. I thought I was in love. This was a grown-up relationship, and it was amazing. For the first year, it was amazing. But then it got bad. I didn't realize that first year he was pulling me away from my friends. I was isolated. He was my whole world. I was skipping school just to be with him. And so, and then he turned it on me. And that's when the mental abuse came and the body shaming came and the name calling. And he would do things to me and I would beg him, please don't leave me, sending him the message that, hey, you could do whatever you want to to me because I'm always going to be here. Mm. I didn't know any better. And then he started to physically abuse me and it got rough. And I went through this from, for almost five years, from the age of 14 to almost 19 years old. I was in this relationship. And by the time it was over, I realized that this guy had stolen everything from me. Just like all the other men in my past, my childhood was gone. I was broken. And so I started going out every night. I was in a different club every night. 
Before I would even hit the clubs, I was drinking tequila, hard liquor, loved to go have fun, loved to be drunk. I had to have a guy on my arm every second because that's where I got my identity from. So I didn't know not how to not have a relationship. It took one more relationship with a guy who hurt me so bad that the cops got involved. And he's, he knew who the guy was because he had a history. And he said, Jennifer, you're lucky to get out of that house with your life. You're lucky to be alive. And I knew then that it had to stop. I was out of control. Something was wrong. Something was broken. I did not know what, but I needed to change. And thankfully... My friend, who I would go clubbing with, she had a history of church. And she had found her way back to Jesus, and she called me. And she said, will you go to church with me? And I just said, yes. I didn't know then that I needed Jesus, but I knew that I needed something, and it wasn't the clubs. So I go to church. I don't remember what the pastor was preaching, but I do remember the altar call because I ran down front. I knew that I needed Jesus, and I knew he was going to meet me where I was that night. And so I gave my life to God that night, and I have never been the same. From that night on, I never stepped back into another club. I stopped drinking. I knew I didn't need any men anymore. It was just me and Jesus, and I have forever been changed by that night. That's an amazing story. Thank you. I know it's not easy to, to no, share. No, it's not. The, the challenge is you were saved, but you still weren't set free. That's right. And, and, it's, and it's because the church for years ha, has distanced itself from actually talking about That's abuse. Right. We don't talk about it. We want you to be happy. We want you to be filled with love and joy and peace. And we're not going to actually talk about your issues. We're going to kind of no. gloss that and say Jesus will fix everything. But Jesus often won't fix everything. You have to use some tools that are it's at your disposal. Process. If you're a parent, you need to listen to those little babies. Please, listen please. to those kids. Be their protector. Listen, if you're the parent of a teenager, it's okay to at times be the bad guy and say, no, you can't hang with those people. I love you too much. Look, I've told my daughters, that if your date comes over here, when they come over here, I'm going to throw them a bullet. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to toss them and be like, you saw that one coming. Next one you ain't going to see coming, you know? And I love that. I got people, and if I had to do it myself, I'd be ready for prison ministry. I'm all good. Whatever. <laughs> I'm ready. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want to negate that with, with yeah. funny stuff. You, you listened to a podcast the other day yeah. that made your blood boil. I want you to talk about so it. It was recently. I just listened to Lisa Bevere. She's an amazing speaker and author. And I was listening to her podcast, and she was talking about this subject of abuse and the church and how the church handles it. And she said, I was preaching at a conference, and when I finished preaching, I went off stage to pray for someone. And she said, this lady came up, and she was crying, and she said, Pastor Lisa, please pray for me. I'm in an abusive relationship, and he actually just threw me down a flight of stairs, and it, it broke me up pretty badly. And Lisa was taken back, and she said, honey, I'm so sorry. She said, you need to get out of that relationship. You need help. Please go home and go talk to your pastor. And the lady stopped, and she said, I did talk to my pastor, and he told me that I must have done something to deserve that. Yes. Somebody needs to throw him down a flight of stairs. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that out loud, but... Uh, this is real church. Yeah. Um, l listen, if, if you're in an abusive relationship, I want you to hear me. Two things. Number one, you've got to get distance. I'm That's not right. telling you to get a divorce. I'm telling you, you've got to get distance now for your own safety. Listen, anybody can victimize you. But I want you to hear what I'm going to say. You have to decide if you're going you're to remain a victim. Okay? A victim mentality says this is the way it's been. This is the way it's, it will always be. If you want to defeat that, You've got to talk to somebody. You've got to get out of that. We have resources today mm -hmm. at our Next Steps uh, table at all of our campuses where you can find the right people to help you. Houston Christian Counseling, you ought to go, go talk to somebody. Get in a group. Her mother was okay. a wonderful lady who didn't know how yeah. to handle it. She didn't have a group of people yeah. around her. And so, and Jen, when you know better, you do better. Back that's right. then, we didn't have the education. So now we have no more excuses. That's so good. Well, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people are hearing this today and maybe... Maybe you're an abuser, and, and what I've discovered when I've talked to abusers at times is they don't know they're an abuser because it was so normal for them. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you what happened with us. All of that brokenness, she's saved, but she's not set free, 
and that enters our marriage. That's right. And our problems began on the honeymoon. That's right. I mean, you heard my story. I mean, just of brokenness and finding Jesus. And when I found Jesus, all the things happened that we are taught and that we um, listen to in the Bible and we read. And I felt like a new creature in Christ. I, I had new dreams. I had new goals. I wanted to draw close to this Jesus that I really never had a relationship with with before but unfortunately and fortunately but unfortunately this guy walked in fortunately but unfortunately probably a little too soon into our yeah, relationship for sure. For sure. Our, with my relationship with Christ and um, I didn't get the time that I needed to fix all those broken that's pieces. why it's so important we talk about building that foundation yes. with Christ we would have still got married but we should have taken some more time we got married after we had known each other for nine months premarital counseling who, Who needs, needs it? That? Yeah. We went to one session and we laughed. We were like, <laughs> we <have laughs> what did that guy know? Yeah. <laughs> everything. He knew everything. Everything we did. He was the smartest man in the world, okay? But it did, that, that cycle started back in day one of the honeymoon. We had our first argument and the cycle began and that's when the abuse began again. Mm -hmm. Only this time it didn't come from a man, it came from me. And that's really hard for me to say because it's like I've always been the one who was being abused and now here I am, I'm the abuser. I only knew one way to fight. And so when he was sitting over there arguing with me, just using his words and not his hands, I didn't know what to do with that because I'm used to defending myself. And so literally all this rage and anger just starts coming out of me. That I didn't even know that I had in me. Well, it was what the psychologists now we know, they call it escalation. So what had happened in all of her relationships is whenever they would get into a fight, uh, he would do something, then she would do something, then he would do something, then she would do something, and finally he would do something so bad. He would throw it through a window or push it through a wall or push her out of her car or whatever that was so bad that obviously, it was obvious to him that he had to apologize. She didn't have to apologize. He would then take all the blames. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so right. sorry. So that's what she was trying to do. She would escalate the fight hoping that at some point I was going to slap her. I was going to punch her. I was going to throw her through a wall so that I would realize, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. But that never happened. So no. she became the one who was constantly escalating. Yes, and it started on the honeymoon, and it was in our marriage. We, we had a baby really fast. I got pregnant on the honeymoon. All this stress, all this tension um, just was mounting. I didn't realize I had postpartum depression. But, guys, I'm not talking about, like, when I, I want you to, to understand how bad it got. So I'll give details. My husband used to walk around with long sleeves during the summertime to cover bruises. He would have to wear makeup to cover the scratches and the bruises on his face. I would call the cops with, you know, at any time and just make up story to get him in trouble. I was so manipulative. I would use my two babies you know, as leverage of, well, if you don't do this, you know, I'm out of here. I'm taking your children. You'll never see them again. I would go behind closed doors, locked doors with my kids, and he didn't know what I was doing. He was fearing for the worst, and I was happy to let him believe that the worst would happen because I was so manipulative to this man. And during that time, here we are in the sm a small town. His father and mother are pastors of a church that's pretty well known there. We're the youth pastors. We're supposed to have it all together. We're supposed to be perfect. So we're having these knockdown, drag out fights in the car on the way to church. And we get to church and we're like, praise the Lord, saints. How y'all doing today? We had nobody to talk to because the expectations were so high. She would wave at people and be like, hey, and I'd be like. <laughs> we poke fun. <laughs> We're poking fun because it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> it this, is uncomfortable. It's really hard for me to tell you guys this because it's harder for me to tell you this part than when I was being abused because I feel so evil. And thank God I'm not this person anymore. Thank God. But I can't believe I treated my husband this way. Well, here's, here's what people need to know. And it took us a while. It took me a long time to figure this out. That's not who you were. No. That's what had happened to you. That's right. But because you had never healed, what had happened to you, those past experiences came out. That's correct. Now, here's the challenge. I had so many high expectations on her that were uncommunicated, there was no way that she could live up to it. 
And so what happened is I didn't love my wife like Christ loved the church. When I, when I realized she had a problem, I was like, hey, you got a problem. You're crazy. You lost your mind, lady. Like, God, deliver me right now. Your son is waiting for the promise, and that ain't it, God. That's, that ain't Don't it. Don't get carried away, baby. And this whole idea. <laughs> Happy anniversary. <laughs> this whole idea of, well, I married the wrong person, I bought into it. Yeah. I married the wrong person. But there was no infidelity. We loved each other. We just didn't like each other. Let me tell you a foolproof way to find out if you married the right person or not. Go home. You're going to have to dig a little bit. Find your marriage license. And on your marriage license, if that, if that person next to you in, in your house, that's the person that's on there, congratulations, you, you married the right person. <laughs> you just got to work on it. You do. And w w what happens is you, you've got to actually be honest. We weren't honest with what we were dealing with. We kept our pain private. Listen, you got to take off the mask. This is why you got to get in a group. I didn't have a group. I didn't have anybody to go to. Yeah. I didn't know who to talk to. And I want you to understand this. God cannot heal who you pretend to be. That's good. You got to get around some people and say, this is who I am. Right. Now, I'm not saying the first week of your connect group, you're like, hey, guys, my name is Jeremy. My wife's beating me. You know, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do that. That's a little weird. It's not a good but, intro. <laughs> but you take, you take some time to get to know some people around you. I wish I'd have known what to do. I didn't yes. know what to do. I'll never forget the day that she said, I'm done. I'm leaving you. I'm out of here. You're never going to see your kids again. And she left. And, and she tried to come back a few days later, and I wouldn't let her back. I, I wish I would have known then yeah. that what we were getting ready to do was a very clear step in helping heal a marriage. And that's number three, you got to work on your issues. you got to work on your issues. I wish I'd have known that's an intentional step. And here's what I want you to understand. I said work on your issues, not their issues. That's right. I could have sat all day long and told you. In fact, if those days, if you'd have sat down and listened to me, I'd have told you everything that was wrong with her. And if you'd have said, what have, what have you done? I'd be like, nothing. What are you talking about? Me? I'm, I'm the victim here. But I didn't realize if I'd have loved her, as Christ loved the church, I would have realized that she was broken. In fact, I was the one who told her that she was abused as a child. Yeah, I didn't even realize it. But instead of saying, hey, you were abused as a child, let's go talk to somebody. I just said, hey, you're abused as a child. I love you. Let me pray it's for you. Normal. You're going to be all right. No. You got to utilize the tools, and yes, God can heal some things, but you also have to talk to somebody. You need to be in a group. You need to go to counseling. I, I think every marriage ought to go to counseling. And we did some things we to did. work on our issues during that separation that I think will help people. Talk about some of the things that you did. Yeah, and so I just, I had to get my focus off of Jeremy because I was very broken and had some deep issues. So the separation for us was the very best possible thing that could have happened, even though I didn't know it at the time. And so literally I couldn't worry about him. I couldn't worry about his emotions, his feelings, because I could not control him or how he felt. I had to work on me. And so I did. I did the hard work. I went to counseling. I got help for myself. I um, resources and read books. Battlefield of the Mind changed my world by Joyce Myers. Please get that book if you're struggling. It, it, it's such a huge help, and it was an inspiration to me. And, um, you know, just leaning on God, finding that relationship with God again. I did not have a relationship with God after we got married. I put him on a shelf for a very long time, and I was just playing a role. And so I found, I found Jesus again, and well, he one, turned my life around. Well, one of the things around. that I say, I was raised in church. I gave my life to Jesus when I was five, but I didn't really need him until I was 25. Yeah. And I was broken and in a broken marriage. And everybody had an opinion. But I found God on an old linoleum gym floor pounding out a relationship with God. I had no hope in this marriage. But I trusted that God was good. And no matter what happened to this, that he was going to keep me and that he was going to bring me through that. And he was going to be my peace and be my Amen. joy and be my hope. So you have good. got to build your hope on things eternal. She's not eternal. I want her to, I want... I want this to be forever, but at the end of the day, I've got to build my hope on Christ. Many of us haven't built our hope on Christ. you got to, you got to work on you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Somebody needs to hear this right now. 
It says this, do not conform to this world. Boy, this is a good one. You could preach it. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's really good, but a lot of us gloss over this one little phrase in there. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not your mind. Yeah. This is talking to you. I, I've got to work on me. And I took some time during those 27 months of painful separation. She had her place. I had my place. We passed the kids back and forth. I didn't know what to do. She was working on her. I didn't know that she was working on her because we were still fighting. Almost every phone call ended in a fight. I had no hope. But I started praying. And I said, I'll do whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes. I, now, I've met people before and they said, hey, your marriage is broken. They're like, we're committed. We'll do whatever it takes. And then we get into a couple of sessions. They're like, mm, I won't do that. You know, I'm like, hey, meatloaf. Uh, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. You, you, need, to, you need to say whatever, whatever it takes. And it's got to be both of us. She was given 100%. I was given 100%. Yeah. You got to go all in. And we fasted. If you don't know anything about fasting, you need to. You need to research it. We're getting ready to go into 21 days of prayer in September where our, our whole church prays together. In the beginning of the year, we do a 21, day, a 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's so important that you learn to fast. I went on an extended fast. What I didn't know, she was, she was fasting at the same time. And I remember going to a conference and this guy coming up to me and saying, I have a word from the Lord for you. I was like, oh, God. It's okay. always scary. <laughs> oh, thanks, God. It's going to be weird or it's going to be super general. Like, God wants to use you. Oh, duh. He wants to use everybody, you know. Um, <laughs> but this guy said, he looked at me and he said, you feel like you've been on the surface of Mars. You feel like you're completely alone. There's nobody in your world. And he said, but God's going to give you faith to begin to speak metropolitan cities in faith into existence. And what he was talking about was learning how to speak in faith things that are not as though they were. Jennifer was learning that. People would come, come up to her and be like, how, how are y'all doing? And she'd tell them what you'd say. I'd say, we're good. We're good. We're whole. We're happy. Our marriage is going to be put back together. No, Jesus we were is not do good. It. We were not happy. We were not whole. In faith. But she was speaking in faith. Right. I didn't know how to do that. I had to learn how to do that. And I will never forget when he looked at me and he said, within 60 days, that thing you've been battling for two years is going to break. And within 60 days, she walked into my office, tears streaming down her face. And she said, I'm sorry, I don't want to be this way anymore. And I had tears streaming down my face. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't want to be this way anymore. And here we are, 18 years in, five kids, pastoring a great church. Don't tell me that God won't change everything if you're committed to it. I'm not saying it's all going to work out perfect. There are people here, you fought for your marriage, but somebody else wouldn't. I can't give 100%, her give 10, and it worked. It's got to be both of us saying, I'm going I'm to get help. I remember in the midst of it, I went to an old bishop, Bishop Tenney. He's already gone on to be with the Lord, but I went to Bishop Tenney, and I just said, I can't do this anymore. I'm so tired of it. I can't stand this. I despise this thing. And he looked at me, and he said, Jeremy. So I talked, Jeremy. He said, don't despise anything that brings you to the foot of the cross. So good. And I realized God didn't make this happen. God doesn't make bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people because we live in a fallen world, right. and this is not heaven. And God allows you to have free will and free choice, and people make choices to do bad things. But the Lord redeems those things, and he can turn the pain into purpose and create a promise to help change other people's lives. And we are standing here as a living example of when you put your trust and your faith and your hope in God, you go to counseling, you get a good group of people around you. I have a good group of people around me right now. Look what the Lord can do. The fourth and final thing that we'll give you in closing is you got to work on finding forgiveness. you got to work on finding forgiveness. A beautiful marriage is simply a good union of two good forgivers. People who learn to forgive. That's right. Jen had to go back. She didn't have any conversations with any of those people. But she had to go back and she had to forgive. She had to release. 
And there's somebody here under the sound of my voice, and maybe, maybe you've walked through some abuse. I'm not saying you got to go confront your abuser. Unless you're currently in abuse, you got to get out, you got to get help. There's officers around every campus. Talk to an officer today. Get in your group. You don't have to go back necessarily and talk to those abusers. But you do have to release that anger. The, the easiest way to do it is to say, all right, I got to find forgiveness. I got to forgive them. And here's why I'm not saying you gloss over the hurt. I, I deal a lot with lamenting. I lament. I wish that would have never happened. I bring that pain to God. I say, God, why did it happen? But I'm going to trust you with it, Lord. I'm going to release that. I can't focus on that. And when you do that, when she learned to do that, it opened up our marriage. And I stopped paying for the pain that someone else caused in her yeah. life. Because there are people in your world right now, if you've not released those people who brought the pain into your life, there are people in your world right now who are paying for pain that they don't know anything about. They don't understand why you get so angry, why you get so frustrated, why you get so mad all the time at little things that they do. But here's why. Because it's a, tr a trigger that reminds you of old pain that you haven't learned to forgive. And then you know what you got to do to all of us. you got to learn to forgive yourself. There are people who will let God forgive them, but they won't forgive themselves. Therefore, they never move into what God has called them to because they just don't believe they can move forward. Listen, in, in order for you to move past something, sometimes you got to go through it. And the easiest way to go through it is say, all right, God, I trust you. I know that you forgive me. I'm going to forgive myself, and I'm going to trust you to walk through this thing together. Jen and I, I want you to walk up here with me, babe. Jen, Jen and I, we, we walked through some things last year that I've never preached about. I mentioned it in one message. Yeah. I, I dealt with some depression last year. I've never dealt with depression in my life, ever. I come from the most positive family. I mean, we pull ourselves up by our, by our own bootstraps. My dad always told me, son, you got to have a backbone like a saw log, determination of a bulldog, and a hide like a rhinoceros. Cowboy up. That's how, that's how I was raised. How weird was that? You know what I mean? Like that's, What does that even mean? I don't know what it means. <laughs> don't ask me stuff like that. Um, but, but that doesn't help you. That mentality doesn't help you. When you drive home at night and you sit in your truck in the, in the driveway for an hour just because you can't get out of the truck. But thank God for a marriage where we now we rely on Christ. We have a good group around us. We're not joking about these groups. We've learned that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And this one came out and got in the truck with me. And we walked through that together. I, I talked to my group about it. And guess what my group helped me realize? Dude, you're working seven days a week. You don't have enough help on the church staff. You're setting expectations for yourself that not even God has set on you. You're not taking one day off. You're working all the time. And I promise you, if you violate the Sabbath, you'll wear yourself out. Even God worked six days, and then he rested. When you work six days, and then you take that one day to rest, and I'm not saying it's got to be pajama day. I can't do pajama day. I need to be active. I need to be on the tractor. I need to be hunting. I need to be fishing. I need to be doing something active, but just not producing in ministry or producing in work, which ministry is my work, not producing something for the church. Listen, if you call me on Monday, you find out how important you are. <laughs> Go to voicemail. You know why? Because I'm with my family. You know why? Because they're more important than you <laughs> to me. If I had a mic, I'd, I'd drop it right there. That was good. good stuff. Jen walked through some stuff yeah. that we've never talked about until this weekend. No, yeah. So, you know, you heard me say that with the first two kids, I had postpartum depression. We didn't know what that was then. Number three came along. I was good. Number four came along. I was great. But number five, our little bonus baby, Gunner. I, I prayed him. I was like, God, he I need did. another dude to help me balance out all the estrogen in this house. He God, did. He prayed that little give guy me another in. Teammate. <laughs> but he wasn't expected. And so I have to admit to you guys, when, when I was pregnant with him, I started feeling depression and sadness. And very, I was very overwhelmed. It was strange. It was very strange. I was excited and she wasn't. Yes. And at first, you know, I wasn't sharing any of this information with my husband because I was embarrassed and I was ashamed of how I was feeling. And so I was just taking all this anger and frustration out on my husband. And here we are in another dark season and, because and of what way, I was I going to, through. I want you to remember that we were pastoring this church at yes. that time. 
This yes. wasn't years and years ago. No. This was the last year. So thankfully, because of our past and all the things that we've walked through, I said, you know what? I'm not going to let the enemy destroy this again. I knew that I had a loving and caring husband, and we have to work on our issues together. So I came to him. Tell him what you told me, what you were feeling. Yeah, I actually, you know, I never, I never had feelings of suicide, but I didn't want to be here anymore. And what that meant was I wanted to pack my bags, and I had thoughts of just packing my bags and leaving town and leaving all of them, not because I didn't love them, because I thought that they would be better off without me because I was so miserable and I was bringing everybody in the house down and making them miserable. And I'm just so thankful that when I told you that, you came along beside me and you helped me. And you said, you know what, baby, we're going to get through this together. We're going to go talk to your OBGYN. You're not going to have postpartum depression. Amen. We're going to work through this while you're pregnant. And we did that. And I'm so thankful because I worked through it. And when Gunner arrived, oh, my God, we were so happy. And that little boy has just filled our, our hearts and our home with so much joy. But I love you. That's what we do. That's proud what we you. do as married people. I'm really proud of you for telling me. That's Dad. a big deal. Thank you, guys. Y'all are awesome. Here's what we're trying to get across to everybody at all of our campuses. This is important. We don't have it all together. We're a work in progress. That's right. But we're a work in progress. And that happens when I keep working on that foundation, when I go through growth track, when I get in the group, when I get on the dream team, when I start discovering my purpose, making a difference, changing somebody's right. life. I realize thing. we matter. We're valuable in the eyes of God. And you can do this, but you got to take that, fir that first step. Everybody say next step. In fact, in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you, at the end of that prayer, campus pastors are going to come up, associate campus pastors are going to come up, and they're going to give you some next step options. I don't want anybody walking out during that time. I talked to you last week about it. All campus, I want you to stay where you are. They may have you stand. Stay where you are. Here's why. Because that moment is so important. Everybody say next steps. Because we're going to give you some next steps. And maybe you're saying, listen, I know all that. I don't need them. But if you roll out, it sends a signal to somebody else, hey, it's time to go. And they may leave. And that may be the moment God's trying to get them to to know what the next steps are. I don't know if your marriage is destroyed. I don't know if it's doing good. I, I don't know where it's at right now, but I do care. I don't know where you are in your faith, but I do care. And I want to pray for you at all of our campuses. Would you bow your heads? Lord, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray right now that you would bring about radical change in hearts and lives and minds and emotions. I pray for those that have been abused, Lord, that you would remind them how much you love them and that you did not cause that to happen, but you can heal them and you can take that pain and you can turn it into purpose. Lord, I pray for those under the sound of my voice who have been the abuser. I pray that they would admit it. I pray that they would seek help. I pray for parents that they would protect those sweet babies. I pray that we would utilize the resources that are at our disposal. I pray for people under the sound of my voice that they know they're feeling called. They need to start a group because somebody in their world, somebody in their sphere of influence needs them to reach out and say, hey, you can make it. And Lord, I pray for those right now under the sound of my voice that are far from you. Maybe those who made a promise at one point, Lord, I'm going to live for you, but they've drifted far from that. Maybe those who just haven't been authentic with you, Lord, and they're wearing a mask and they need today to say, that's me, I, I need you, Jesus. Or maybe those who've never put their trust in you. If that's you, under the sound of my voice, here's what I want you to do. Maybe you drifted. Maybe you're still wearing a mask or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. If that's you and you, you want to make that right today, I just want you to lift your hand. Just boldly put your hand up and say, that's me. I'm coming home, Jesus. Put your hand up right now. Hands, 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 hands. Thank you. Hands, 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 hands. Come on, let's give these folks a great big ovation. A lot of courage. All of our campuses, I want us to pray this prayer right now. Will you pray with me? Jesus, you're the only one who can save me. So I'm trusting you right now with my pain and my past and my heartache. Forgive me of my sins. 
I repent. I'm asking you to be my Savior. I'm declaring you that you are my Lord. And I'm putting my faith in you. And I'm declaring right now that I will follow you all the days of my life. Change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give Jesus an ovation of worship.